As you would see from the card that you would receive as you came in, we are beginning today a series of sermons on what we have called foundation truths. That is, truths which lie at the very basis and roots of the Christian faith. You will realize, I am sure, that in many areas of the church and throughout the whole of our nation, and indeed throughout the world in these days, there is a great deal of confusion about some of the fundamental truths of the Christian faith and gospel. And our concern on these Sunday mornings is to seek to clarify and to restate and proclaim again some of these fundamental biblical truths that lie at the heart of the Christian gospel. They are of great importance for all of us, whether we have been Christians for some time and made a profession of faith in Christ a long time ago, or whether we are perhaps just at the stage of putting our toe in the water, as it were, in Christian interest or to change the metaphor, nibbling at the edge of the Christian gospel. I want us to turn, first of all, this morning to what is undoubtedly one of the basic fundamentals of the Christian faith, and that is the one you will find in Acts chapter 4, where you would find it helpful to have your Bible open, and at verse 12 the truth of the uniqueness of Jesus Christ. The Apostle Peter, the first preacher after Pentecost in the Christian church, puts this this way. Salvation, he says in Acts 4.12, is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. You could not possibly find anything that was in one sense more exclusive. He says nowhere, nowhere in the world, for no man or woman in the world, is there any other way to be saved than through Jesus Christ. There is one name that has been given under heaven. And under heaven is an all-inclusive term. It means that this is true for everybody of whatever race or culture, of whatever color or language. It is true universally that in Jesus Christ and in Jesus Christ alone, There is salvation, and that lies at the foundation of the Christian faith. And Peter, at a moment when his own life and his companion John's appeared to be in some danger, stands to make clear what the Christian gospel begins with, and it is this exclusive, unique claim that Jesus Christ is not just a Savior, nor a figure amongst religions. He is the only Savior. There is no other Savior than Jesus whom God has sent. Wherever you go in the world, or from whatever background you may come, that is universally true. Peter is, of course, addressing the religious rulers of Israel. They had seen the evidence of the dramatic power of the Christian gospel in the healing of a man who had lain for years at the temple gate helpless. Organized religion could do nothing for him. And Peter and John came, and Peter fixed his eyes upon him and said, 
I have nothing that I can give you that would relieve your beggardom, but I can give you this in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Stand up and walk. And the man rose up and walked, and of course there was commotion throughout the whole city. And people gathered in droves, and Peter and John began to proclaim to them the Christ who was responsible for this transformation. And soon the religious authorities became concerned and they put John and Peter in prison to allow them to cool off overnight. And then the next morning they summoned them and challenged them. And we read about this in Acts 4, chapter 7. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them. By what power or in what name did you do this? And Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and Elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a cripple and are asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel. It is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. He is the stone you builders rejected. Quoting from Psalm 118 which has become the capstone, or you'll see in the margin the cornerstone, that is probably the chief foundation stone that holds the whole structure together. Salvation is found in no one else. There is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. Now you will notice the way in which the uniqueness of Jesus Christ comes through, first of all, in Peter's preaching. It comes through in the fact that, first and foremost, Peter points them to Jesus Christ crucified and risen as the cornerstone of the gospel. He does not point them, in other words, to a set of models. He does not point them to a philosophy of life. He points them to Jesus Christ. And if you now, at this moment, have come to the point where you have begun to be interested in the Christian faith, like these men, for whatever reason, I want to say to you that this is the point at which you need to begin. There is no question about what biblical Christianity identifies as the first fundamental of the faith. It is this, that biblical Christianity is not a philosophy of life which you adopt. Many people have imagined that it is. Biblical Christianity is not an ethical system to which you conform. It is not an ecclesiastical organization which you join. Nor is it a scheme of doctrine even to which you subscribe. Biblical Christianity is a relationship into which you enter with Jesus Christ. That's why Paul and Peter and all the apostles and down through the generations wherever the Christian gospel has been preached, the first element in that preaching has been to set forth Jesus Christ as the Savior and the one to whom we must come. So Paul says, to me to live is Christ. If you had wanted to ask him what the new ambition that the Christian faith had given to him really was, he would have said, I want to know him, referring to Jesus. And biblical Christianity is a living relationship with Jesus Christ, who is both God and man. Herein, Peter, at the very least, hints at his uniqueness, and I think clearly sets it forth. 
He is emphasizing it in the name to which he refers. And he does so many times in connection with this man. He calls Jesus, do you notice in verse 10, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Now you will know that Jesus is our Lord's human name. It is the name that identifies him as a real person who was born in history at a particular time. Peter adds of Nazareth, probably to identify him as someone who was born in a real place at that particular time. The Nazarene had become a term of abuse, probably. But Peter is speaking of him as Jesus Christ of Nazareth. But he is not just Jesus of Nazareth, do you notice? He is also God's anointed Messiah, who by the resurrection from the dead is powerfully declared to be God's Son. Now, this is the first area in which the uniqueness of Jesus Christ is seen. He is himself the foundation of the Christian faith as the one who is both God and man. Now, if you know anything about the religions of the world, There is no other religion where its founder is the foundation of that religion. But you cannot conceive of Christianity without Jesus Christ himself as the foundation. This is why the Apostle Paul says, there is no other foundation that can be laid than that which is already laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, my friends, do you see why it is so important when people begin to tamper with who Jesus Christ is and what he has done and what he claims for himself? When you tamper with that, you tamper with the very foundation of the Christian religion. And therefore, the whole edifice comes down because the Christian gospel is built upon the person and work of Jesus Christ, fully God and fully man, and unique in that sense. So this is the first and vital thing. And it leads me to the second, which is this. That not only is Jesus Christ the one to whom we are called to be related in the beginning of the proclamation of the Christian gospel, it is he and he alone who is the true revelation of God to men and women like ourselves. You will know that in the Old Testament, perhaps, God revealed himself by his name. When Moses asked, when I go to these people and they ask me, who sent you? What shall I say? How shall I show them who sent me? And God gave him a name. It was a very simple name. I am, he said. Now, more than once, Jesus used that name of himself. He took it to himself. And when they spoke to him about Abraham, for example, he said, before Abraham was, I am. When they came to arrest him, he was asked, are you Jesus of Nazareth? And he said, I am. And they fell back. Astonished, not because he had identified himself as the man Jesus, 
but because they were overwhelmed by the revelation of this name. Now the name God has given whereby we are to be saved is the name in whom all the character of God is revealed to us. That is the great uniqueness of Jesus Christ in the second place. He is the revelation of the nature and glory of God in the world. Now, he himself made that abundantly clear, and everybody who is ever beginning to inquire about the Christian faith needs to come to terms with this he said when one day one of his disciples, Philip, asked him, Lord, we will be satisfied if you will just show us God, the Father. And Jesus said, He who has seen me has seen the Father. Why do you ask then, show us the Father? Because he who has seen me has seen the Father. And Jesus went on in different ways to say not only that to look upon him was to look upon God and to listen to him was to listen to God, but to honor him was to honor God. And people said of him, we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father full of grace and truth. Now that means on the one hand that wherever you may go under heaven there is no other way to come to know God than through Jesus Christ. That's what he meant when he said I am the way no man comes to the Father except by me. And there is no other way that we can come to know God than through Jesus Christ. But of course that is a glorious encouragement, is it not? It means that we are not left in this world to search in various spheres and places to try to discover what God is like. It has been one of the quests of men and women down through history to try to find out what God was like. And Jesus says, He who has seen me has seen the Father. The search ends in Jesus. He is the revelation of God. Of none other is that true. But the third thing in which the uniqueness of Jesus Christ appears in what Peter says here is in his purpose in coming into the world, which was not merely to reveal God to us. In one sense, that would not really be a gospel, would it? It would not be good news to discover that Jesus Christ had shown us God in all his majesty and glory and holiness and righteousness and justice. He had come not only to reveal God, but to rescue us. And there is no question that the uniqueness of Jesus Christ consists in this too, that he is a savior. And when Peter talks about his unique purpose in coming into the world, it is this. Salvation, he says, is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. Now, saved from what? Well, saved most manifestly from all the ravages that man's sin have wrought in his life, saved from all the defilement that sin has brought, saved from the guilt that it has brought to us, saved from the way that it has made us increasingly through our lives its slaves. 
but saved above everything else from the judgment of God upon sin. And this is where Jesus Christ is unique. By his death as our sin bearer, who took our place and bore our judgment, And by his resurrection, by which God the Father declared that he was satisfied with Christ's sacrifice, we receive from his hands salvation. Now here is one of the unique things about the whole of the Christian gospel. I have a friend who labored for years in a Muslim country in North Africa. And after he came back home, we talked for some time, and I said to him, what would you say was the real ultimate distinction between Islam and Christianity? I know that was an unfair and in some ways a stupid question. But you can understand why we wanted to know that sort of thing. He said, I think, if I were to lay my finger on the one thing that makes the Christian gospel distinctive from every other religion in the world, it would be summed up in this word, free grace. Now, what he meant was this, you see, that the Christian gospel was not advice to people on how they may learn to save themselves. It was not some kind of counsel on what terms God is willing to accept you. It is not some theory of how you may make yourself acceptable to God It is the glorious good news that in Jesus Christ, God has done everything. Before we were born, he has done everything that will ever be necessary to lift the burden of our sin, to free us from guilt, to deliver us from its bondage, and to bring us salvation as a gift. There is no other name under heaven given to men. Now it is this that above everything makes the Christian gospel so gloriously unique. That in Jesus Christ everything has been done for our salvation We simply stretch out the beggar's open hand. And God pours the riches of his mercy into it. Now I need to ask you before we close this morning. Is this the foundation on which you are building? the foundation which is Jesus Christ, fully God and fully man, the foundation that is resting on him as God's revelation to us, so that in him and in him alone we come to know what God is like, the foundation of his finished work, so that by grace alone we receive the gift of salvation. Is that where you are resting this morning? Because you will notice what Peter is telling these religious leaders to whom he speaks. He quotes that 118th Psalm which we sang earlier in our service this morning. The stone you builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. 
The picture, of course, is of builders who have been looking for a stone that will provide stability to the rest of the building, and they have looked over various stones and thrown them aside. And Jesus says this is the story of religious people like yourself. You have been builders who have rejected the main foundation stone as you have rejected Jesus Christ. And he alone is able to bring salvation to you. The greatest tragedy of life is to follow in their footsteps and to reject the one whom God has sent to be the chief cornerstone of our salvation. And for our own sakes, as well as for the sake of his glory, we need to come to him and say afresh, My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. On Christ, the solid rock, I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. It is of cardinal importance to find that out sooner and not later. Let's pray together. Almighty God, we thank you that you have sent forth your only begotten Son made to be a man for our salvation in order to bear our sin and to bring us to you. And as you have identified him as the chief cornerstone, we pray that we may rest upon him this morning and make him our Savior. We ask it for his glory. Amen. Now let's sing together as our closing hymn these words which you will find at hymn 411. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. 411.
now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God our Heavenly Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, be with us, everyone, this day and always. this primacy of Scripture over the whole of his life and service, because of the testimony of those who teach him, because of the origin of Scripture itself, and finally, let me point out to you, because of the manifold benefits or purposes or profit of Scripture. And he says several things. I just point them out to you before we finish. First, it is our only safe guide to salvation. Chapter 3, verse 15, How from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Now, why is it that Scripture is the only safe guide for salvation? I tell you why. Very simple. It is because Scripture is the only safe guide to Christ. Now, that's a vital thing. We would all of us be absolutely unanimous who are Christian believers this evening that salvation for sinners is only found in Jesus Christ, would we not? But I tell you, the fundamental question is this. Which Christ is it that you trust in? Which Christ is it that you summon people to believe in? Which Christ is it that you commend to people? Well, my dear friends, I tell you there is only one Christ, and that is the Christ of Scripture. That's why it's so absolutely vital when people are searching for Christ or awakened to Christ or convicted of their sin that you take them to Scripture. Because only Scripture is able to make us wise unto salvation. It's not the Christ of my experience. It is not the Christ of other people's experience. It is the Christ of Scripture we are to invite people to believe in. That's why it has happened so often. I tell you, it has happened in this place. When I have said to people, when they have been inquiring after the Christian gospel, I have said to them, take John's gospel and read it. Now, my dear friends, over the... What is it, 16 years that I've been here, I have lost count of the number of people. I think of one of them this evening, a letter from whom I was looking at on my desk this afternoon, who is now in the mission field, and who came here and I said to her, read John's gospel and ask God to reveal his son to you there, for that's why it was written. And she went away, a highly intelligent woman and read John's Gospel. And the next time I saw her, her face beamed with light, and she said, I have come to know him. I have come to him. It is the only safe guide to salvation. And so, says Paul, it is profitable. In chapter 3, verse 16, it is profitable or useful for teaching, for rebuking, that is, for dealing with error in our lives, for bringing us under conviction about things that are wrong and need to be set right in our lives, for correcting. That's the word that gives to our language words like orthodontist, you know. There was an orthodontist here in this church last Sunday evening 
who in her own words told me she had embraced Christ before she went home. Orthodontists put your teeth right, you know. When things go wrong with them, that's why people wear some of these braces and so on. They set them right. And Paul says that's what the scripture does. It takes things in your life, it cuts you to the quick as it drives home as to what is wrong in your life. And then it sets it right. It is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness so that we may be men and women of God thoroughly equipped in every way to serve him. But I tell you, this is how we are to serve him. You know we were celebrating this. uh, You're bound to hear about this from me for a long time, so don't uh, be too tired. We were celebrating the writing of the Westminster Confession in these last few days. That confession has shaped the lives of multitudes of people all over the world. The shorter catechism especially has been instrumental in the shaping of the character and the communication of righteousness to Scottish people over centuries. And what's the first chapter in the Westminster Confession? What's the first subject it touches upon, I tell you? It's Holy Scripture. Why did these wise men of Westminster say this? I mean the ones of 350 years ago. (laughs) They said it because if you're right there, you'll be right everywhere. And I would want to go around this church and sit beside you in your pew and say to you this evening, if you're right there, you'll be right everywhere. You get that right in your life and you will be right everywhere. Holy Scripture in the absolutely primary place, Lord over your mind, Lord over your life. That's God's desire and he does it by bringing you into submission and obedience to Holy Scripture. May God in His grace make us like that more and more. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, we have been speaking of things that are infinitely important for every one of us, whether we really recognize it or no. In your great mercy, write your word upon our hearts for your glory and for our good. Amen. Now, even though we are marginally later than usual, I want us to sing a hymn which really expresses a great deal of what we have been reading. 331 is the number, the heavens... Declare thy glory, Lord, in every star thy wisdom shines. But when our eyes behold thy word, we read thy name in fairer lines. Number 331.